Hi everybody, Mark here from PondAlgaeSolutions.com and as promised in this video I want to talk a little more about beneficial bacteria and how to use this in your pond to help with managing nutrients that can feed algae growth. Phosphorus is really talked about a lot as the limiting factor for algae growth, which is why I focused on that in my original discussion. When phosphorus is high, you can get a lot of growth, and when it's low, but nitrogen is fairly abundant, you still may not see a lot of algae. So what it comes down to is that when you put either have beneficial bacteria in a pond that is well supported, and that's a very critical thing to keep in mind, uh, or you supplement bacteria in, you are cross-competing against that algae for those elements or nutrients in the water. And they can often do a pretty good job of that. So, you, you know, when you use a microbial in a pond, you're never killing anything. You're simply changing the environment or in effect, where phosphorus and nitrogen are being held. Um, and I think that's, that's the simplest way to look at it. When f a plant dies or when um, a bacteria dies or when you digest muck, which also holds phosphorus and nitrogen, in all of these cases, the phosphorus and nitrogen are not removed they're basically released back into the water column. They still remain in the pond. So this sounds like a real problem. It sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually not. It's, it's nature's way to sustain life. Now the key with this is, and the, the crucial role that bacteria can play in this, is that when you have a healthy population of beneficial bacteria in a pond environment, and they are thriving, and they have the things that they need to sustain, and a a vit vital life, you know, a life with vitality. What are those things? Well, good oxygen. That's why we talk about aeration so much. Um, they need temperatures typically that are above 55 to 60 degrees. Otherwise, they go into a spore form. When things warm up, they're constantly sensing the environment around them. When things warm up, they start to come out and become active bacteria. They also need reasonable mineralization alkalinity and hardness that's not too low and not too high, pH that's not too low, not too high. And with these things, they can thrive. And when they do, they serve as a buffer against potential algae growth, for one thing, because they're constantly bringing in these nutrients and sequestering them during their life. And even though they die, and when they die, they release the nutrients back into the water, as long as the environment is supportive of new bacteria coming along, when they die, they also release spores, spores of more bacteria that when the conditions are right, they come out and they become active bacteria, which then take in the nutrients once again and sequester them. So you have this repeating process of give and take in the environment. And we've seen it many times when, when the bacteria are doing their, their work and when they're supported well, they can help curb or reduce algae blooms. And again, they're not killing anything. They're just sequestering those nutrients. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, and this is why your work on the muck is so important. So yes, when you break this muck down with biologics, the phosphorus and nitrogen within that muck is released into the water column. But here's a really important thing. When you continue to work that muck down, although it does contain and hold phosphorus and nitrogen to some extent, there is a constant leaching of these nutrients out of muck. Even when it's oxygenated, it, it will lose some of that into the water column, slowly releasing it. When you aerate and you increase oxygen low in a pond though, you get an oxidation of any iron that's down in muck or in sediment, and that iron will bind to phosphorus. It will actively bind it up and hold it. Without oxygen in a pond uh, or good oxygen levels low in the pond, the reverse is true. The phosphorus is leaching out even more. Interestingly, a lot of studies have been done on sediment over the years, and uh, I'll put a graph up in a moment which will show the overall and this is a, a compilation from a number of studies. It's not exact numbers, but it shows the overall 
you know, view of this, but you will see that Muck has a fairly moderate binding capacity. But as you start to expose natural sediment through the work that you're doing, when you get to sand and especially clay and rock, you will find the binding capability, the intensity of the binding of the phosphorus is much higher. And so in both these cases, although phosphorus and nitrogen are released back into the pond water or into the water column, when, you know, muck is reduced, you actually get a better binding of it in the, at the sediment level, ultimately, if a pond is, is oxygenated well and the sediment is exposed. So the work that you're doing there is good. But keep in mind, in both these cases, we're not removing phosphorus and nitrogen from the pond. We're simply sequestering it. We're relocating it. So in places that algae can't use it. And that is how beneficial bacteria in its various forms can help to work against algae in a pond environment. It doesn't work the way some people think, and I understand that. The terminology doesn't take it far enough the way we use it when we say we want to reduce nutrients that feed algae. But what we're really doing is just what nature does, and that is sequestering it, reallocating it, and putting it in places that the plant can't use it.